But before we get into Genesis chapter 1 and living at a life with God, I want to, I want to take a look at a life without God. And even though Job was, God said he was a righteous man, you know, even when we have some difficult times, difficult moments in our life, we sometimes end up having moments where we have a life without God. And this, this was a moment for Job. He, he lost everything, all of his possessions, all of his kids, all of his, his herd, all of his wealth. He lost everything. And in Job chapter 3, verse 3, with his health at the worst, he says, Let the day perish in which I was born. Let the night perish that said a man child is conceived. That, that very day, let there be darkness. Let gloom and deep darkness claim it. Let clouds settle upon it. Let the blackness of the day terrify it. Let fools curse it who curse the day. Those who are skilled to rise up the luck of him. In other words, sea monster. Can we all agree that Job was having a bad day here? Yeah, he was. When Job says, let the darkness be there, God says, let there be light. And where Job says that everything is cursed, God says everything is blessed. You ever wonder why God started up this mess of creation? Why he started building things like us sitting here today? I mean, it's a mess. And in the ancient world, when everything went bad, it was because of the imperfect gods that they had created. There was gods that were weak, but they were still gods. They were above them. And the other thing is that, the, that they would worship the created rather than the creator. You know, they worship the sun and the moon and the stars and, and things on the earth and, and, and animals and that. And there's many different stories of creation because of many different cultures that was going on. But then there comes this one. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That sentence changed everything in this universe. It wasn't created to set... That, that it wasn't created by sea monsters or chaos or other gods. It, there was no struggle in creating it because of this verse here, this seven. Because they are difficult times. Things are out of control. And this sentence showed that this, this one God has every, everything under control. And we look at life so many times as, as we have no control of it. Amen? And the reason of that is because that's so I. Everything is out of our control. We don't have any control on what's going on. And, and, and you know that you can be a prophet this morning? Yeah, I'm going to make you all a prophet. I want you to take your middle finger out, like your index finger out here. Take your finger out and point it to the person next to you and say, you're not in control. <laughs> you're not in control. <laughs> Somebody point at your spouse is a little bit too long. <laughs> you only need to say it once. Listen, we're not in control. It doesn't matter about our education. It doesn't matter how much money we have. It doesn't matter about our job. It doesn't matter about the people that we know. It doesn't matter about the worries that we have because we're never going to have the control. We're never going to have that. And, and if we do everything in our life to try to get that, how long will that peace last? And the only time we're going to be in control is probably when we die. And you're not going to be happy then either. <laughs> Listen. God is saying, God, we need to get to the point that we surrender. That's where it all starts at. That's where the beginning at in our life with God is we surrender. We say, God, you know what? I know I'm not in control. That I can't do the things that I need to do and, 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 and change the things in my life because I just can't. But I know you can it's living a life that, that, that you're completely in confidence with God. That He is the strength and the power and the Almighty and that He is the one that can do that. The other thing is, is that uh, we see in Genesis chapter 1 that God is creating over and over again. Every day He's creating something new, it shows here in Genesis chapter 1. And Genesis wants us to, to show that even sea monsters that people fear were created by God. And there's no force against him. God made them and he can unmake them. We, we know that there's species that are, that are extinct now. And that's all in God's control. We can blame ourselves because of the way that we live our lives. And we pollute the world and do all these things. But God is still in control. And this is our Father's world. God created it. And he is more powerful than anything else in this world. Than anything that he ever created. 
And He created the sea monsters. He created your boss. He created your spouse. And that's why He says, do not fear. Do not be afraid. And you ever think that God allows chaos into our lives? You ever think that God brings that in and, and that God creates chaos in our lives to get our attention? Well, if you do, you're, you're wrong. Because 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 33 says this, For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace. But in the Bible, it tells us 366 times, do not fear. Even we fear. We've got that promise. Every day of our life, of the year, we can say, do not fear. And there's a reason. Do not be afraid because I am with you. That's what he tells us. And he is with us. Because even when we wake up, even through our whole day, even when we fall asleep, we can have the confidence that God is still in control. And that he is stronger than anything in this world. He is stronger than anything that can be, that come against us. And we have to have faith in order to do that. Faith is what grows out of going through a chaos in our life. We have troubles in our life. I don't care if you've been a Christian for 30, 50 years. I don't care. You're going to have some chaos in your life. Because that's why we live it. That's because we live in a sinful world. When we have sin in the world, we have chaos. And there's nothing that we can do about it. In order to live a life with God, we have to, we have to take full confidence in God's strength and His power and His might. And all the things that he does in the chaos. And taking on the sea monsters in our life. And believing that he has all the power under him. In the ancient worlds. In the ancient stories. Humans were created uh, in, in their means to serve these lesser gods. That's why they were created. But that's not the case in Genesis. In Genesis, uh, God, the God in Genesis has no means, needs that need to be met. We're not here to, to, to meet God's needs. He doesn't have any needs. He is all-powerful. He has everything. And we've got to go, well, why did He create such a mess then? And He created this earth, not for Him, but for us to be here. For us to work with Him. To, for us to be uh, created to, to be just like Him in His image, it says. We're to, we look just like Him. We, we act like Him. That's our original pattern. That's the original design. But somewhere that blueprint got lost. And we'll talk about some of that next week. But even in that, God said He was very happy with it. Even though we are what we are, God says He's happy about it. Remember the old E.F. Hutton investment commercials? Remember e. F. when E.F. Hutton talks, everybody listens? You know, they'd be in a room full of people and there's a lot of noise going on and, and two guys are talking about their investments and they say, when E.F. Hutton talks, everybody else does one of those. When God speaks, things happen, though. You can't, in, you can't trust your investments. You can't trust other people sometimes. You can't trust money. You can't trust the things of the world. But when God speaks, we should be able to be able to trust that. Amen? Amen. Because we can look at Genesis chapter 1 and verse 2. It says, the earth was formless and empty. When God speaks, things happen. There was light. There was land. There was bodies of water. There were vegetation. There were animals. There were fish. There were bugs. There were snakes. There were birds. There were even man and woman. God created everything. And, and when God speaks, things begin to start coming into shape. Things start forming together. When God speaks, things change. And I want to ask you, it says here, in, in, in chapter 1 it says it says that all these things were created by God from the dirt of the ground. Does your life seem a little dirty today? Do you feel like dirt today? Maybe it's because you're struggling with a relationship that has no form. Maybe it's because you're overwhelmed with, with bills and finances that, that make you feel empty. Maybe you're lonely and depressed and anxious and sick and you just can't go on anymore, and you feel like you have no life in you. I want to tell you, you know why that is? Because we're over busy, we're over scheduled, and we're not listening to God. We're not listening to what God wants to create in us through His words. When God speaks, it's just like that song, ancient words. These are ancient words, but they're still true today. They're still real today. And, and we don't need to be afraid. We don't need to live empty lives anymore. We don't have to keep going on with the way that we're going on. 
And this is in Psalm 46, verse 10. It says, be silent and know that I am God. We, we miss out on that so often, don't we? We forget that God is God and that we think that we're God so many times and, and we're not in control. God is the one in control. God is the one that forms things. God is the one that puts things together. And God is patient and has been putting up with this for so long. But when are we going to let him start forming us into the way that he wants us to be? When are we going to get back to that original design that we're in the image of God? When's that going to happen? It happens when we start listening to God. And we can notice that over and over when God is speaking and forming and creating and making something out of nothing, it, He says it's good. When He says it's good, it doesn't mean it's just good. It means that it works. It means that this is the way it's supposed to happen. That God is supposed to make things happen. Remember when Adam was alone? He, he was giving names to all the other, the other creatures out there and naming everything. And, and uh, God says, that ain't good. And he created Eve. And he says, that's really good. It was really good. And it worked out so good that God says, be fruitful and multiply. And it worked out so good that God blessed man and, and woman and, and wanted them to even have more of them. In the story, we're made in the image of God, but in the ancient stories, only like kings were like gods. That's not the case here. It, it doesn't matter if we're peasants or we're poor or we're just everyday people. We're still in the image of God. That God has created us for a purpose and a purpose greater than anything that we can create on our own and trying to build that. And this story is, is all, uh, in the story, all are just like God. And we have the dominion and the power over the things of this earth because we are just like God. We are not God, but we're just like God. We have things that we can do that make things different. And when something doesn't work in our chaotic life, in our little life, when, when things don't seem to be right, what does God do? He sends a helper. When Adam was having a difficulty, what did he do? He sent a helper. He didn't send a servant. He didn't send a genie to do all the wishes that the man had. He sent a helper. Someone to stand beside him. And the same is true today. That God sends a helper. When Jesus said, I'm going to leave this earth, he says, I'm going to send a helper. That helper is the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God. That all of us can indwell. That all of us can, can, can be filled with. The great evangelist D.L. Moody was asked one time, why do you always have to be asked to be filled up by the Holy Spirit? He said, because I leak a lot. <laughs> Many of us leak. Every day we need to be asked to be filled by the Holy Spirit because we're fragile vessels. That's what God calls us. These words in here tell us that we're broken pots, that we, we can't hold anything very long. We have a hard time holding on to everything in the world, let alone the Holy Spirit. Every day we need to ask for the Holy Spirit to fill us and renew us. And we need a helper in this life. And when we start depending on that helper, the Holy Spirit, our life will change. We don't rely too much. We don't think too much about the Holy Spirit and the work that it does in our lives. But that is the, that's the substance of God right now living within us. So what came after the sixth day? Anybody? The seventh day. The Sabbath. I just wanted to say the seventh day. It's just like you said, I don't know. No. <laughs> Why is this day so important, though? I mean, God had to rest on the seventh day? Is God tired? Does God ever get tired? I mean, why does God have to rest? Why does God have to rest? You know what? This is all out of, out of text because that's the way we think. But God is not resting on the seventh day. God is sitting on the throne on the seventh day. God is in power on the seventh day. For six days, He worked. On the seventh day, He took His position and is working. God is making a difference. In Genesis, he told, we're told the Lord put, God put uh, man in the garden to serve and to keep. Now, if you see a, a car along the highway that says uh, to serve and protect, what do you do? Slow down. That's a cop car. Most of them say that on the side. How many of us have worked seven days in a row or more than seven days? How, did, how does your body feel? You're tired. You know, there's scientific evidence to that, that our bodies are not meant to work more than six days in a row. That 
that it starts affecting our body. But here's, here's what's going on, is that we need to understand that, that the Old Testament is telling us time and time again that we are to serve and to keep, and that's what that was directed towards the high priest. That was directed towards the high priest in the, in the Old Testament, to serve in the temple. And, and in the old tabernacle, in the old tent, there was three chambers. One was for the people to come and offer their sacrifices. One was the next one where the, the high priest would come in there and, and, and offer that sacrifice to the Lord. And one day out of the year, that high priest was able to go into presence, that last chamber, into the last place, to be in the presence of the Lord. We're in that last chamber now. We're in that presence. That's what the seventh day is. That's what the Sabbath is. It's the day of, of, of bringing the temple to the earth. When God created the earth, it wasn't just to be a paradise. It was to be the temple. God created everything to be a temple. You and I are a temple. And, and it didn't mean that God was going to be on vacation on the seventh day. It, didn't, it meant that God was about to begin His work. And we're going to be part of it. God is saying that on the seventh day, when He begins His throne, sitting on the throne and, and the work begins, He's saying, you know what? I'm going to start enjoying people with me. I'm going to start working with people with me. We're going to have prosperity between us and, and my, my people. We're going to be living together. And, and just like Jesus, He was condemned. Remember? On the Sabbath for healing? He was condemned for that. But Jesus was working. He was doing the work of, of God. And, and so we can't misconcept what the seventh day really is. Every day is a day to work for the Lord. Amen? Amen. And, and, and the seventh day is a day of rest. But it should be a, a day of rest from the rest of the world. You know what I'm saying? Forget your job. Forget about the other things that, that take over your life on the other six days. And, and start focusing on the Lord. The rest, of, the rest of the seventh day is a rest from the world. And the seventh day means your kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it does on heaven, in heaven. Even though, as we close here, even though God took the chaos, the formless and empty, and brought organization, chaos came back into the world in sin. And we'll look at that next week. Our great, our great calling in our world, in our church, and even in ourselves, and even in our hearts, is to place God to live there. Amen? Amen? I mean, God needs to live in our hearts. It doesn't matter how much head knowledge you got. It doesn't matter how much physical activity you do at church. It matters what goes on in your heart. And that's where God takes residence at. And the reason that there's pain and suffering and death in our world isn't because of some superstitious force, not because of something that we've made up, not because of sea monsters or, or other things going on. It's because there's chaos in the human heart. The reason that we live in a sinful world is because sin is still rampant in our world. The reason that we have chaos and, and destruction is because we still have this heart problem. And God wants to do something different in your heart. He wants to bring you to a place that, that changes that. And God is still creating things. He's changing hearts. He's creating new things. And David even says, create me a new heart. Create me a new being. And God's Word says that you are a new creature when you come to Jesus Christ. That you are something new and changed. And you don't think the same way. You don't act the same way. Here's what we have to, when we face chaos in our lives, this is what we need to remember. Whether it be regrets or betrayal or loneliness or divorce, this is what we got to remember. Is that a king came once. He came in the manger. And sin started from a tree, but that king came to another tree called the cross. And even though that tree killed him, he didn't stay there. And even today, he reigns more powerful than ever before. God is still in control. 1 Corinthians 6, 19, as we close here. Your bodies are a temple for the Holy Spirit. And we need to take the broom out today and clean the corners out a little bit. Amen? Amen. Maybe we need to check our heart and get a tune-up a little bit. Maybe we need to see where we're at in our lives and, and see how much Jesus is filling that. How much the Holy Spirit is filling our, our vessel, our temple, our lives. We're going to make the heart our, His home, are we not? And what, is, what was at the beginning is still here today. And we're going to make this His temple. Amen? Amen.